Good evening, a gesunden winter. I hope that Yamtiv, which I talked so much about Simcha and so much about the Koyach of Elul Tishrei, Simcha, everything, that it's going to seep into and drench each and every family and each and every kehila, because the schus of simcha for, for Yom Tiv, to bring out the birkas mo'yadecha is unbelievable. Now, I want to acknowledge and thank Torah Anytime, who are one of the sponsors we usually have uh, every week, uh, 300, 400, 500 in YouTube and call in Torah anytime, and then call a lotion. But uh, there were some weeks that I had, I had 2,000 YouTube for Yom Kippur. And for this week for, for Hoshana Rabbah, Shmini Atzeres, Simchus Torah, and Bereshis, I had over a thousand just on Torah any time. And the effort to go in, I'm not paid and they don't, and this is on their side, I don't pay for it and they don't pay me. This is L'Shem Shemayim that we all hope everyone involved has a schus ha-Torah with being Mekadah Shem Shemayim Barabim, period. But there are costs, and there are, there's so much time that goes into it. I just want to publicly acknowledge and to thank them, everyone involved in each way, to be able to bring the messages of Divrei Torah, of Hisoiris, of Hashkocha, the Segulas for Klal Yisrael, and their effort will never go in vain. Can you imagine if 200 and 600 and 800 are listening? So the schutz for everyone involved is tremendous. And the last acknowledgement that I want to say for just a minute, Cholamoid, I received a phone call from the Kehila, the head of the Kehila of Ribnitz. You know that the day after Shabbos, Bereshis, four days ago, was the yard site of Reb Levi Yitzhak Bardichev and the Chassam Sofer, Chofhei. Chavav, Sunday night, Monday, was the yard site of the Ribnitzer Rebbe Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Levrocha Zechuso Yogen Aleinu. And I received a day before Hoshana Rabbah in the middle of Cholamoid a call from that Kehila in Muncie. And they asked me, the art said is Sunday night, we want to send a car for you, and we want you to be the speaker at the art site Suda. They had around five, six hundred at the art site Suda. And I, I accepted. I felt it was I was humble, but I accepted. And they took me first to the Tzian. And there was around two, 3,000 people there by the Ribnitzer's Tzian. And then they drove me over to the Suda that obviously not everyone attended. Uh, they have a Talmud Torah of seven, eight, nine hundred children. And this was for the Talmud Torah. And it's named, that Talmud Torah is named after the Ribnitzer Rebbe. And after I got done speaking, uh, a group of people held me there for another hour. After, I was expecting to go right back into the car that was waiting for me and to come back to Borough Park and go to Shomer Shabbos and Davin Meiriv, which would be around 11 o'clock. I didn't get there till 12.30 uh, because these people were asking me questions and uh, we were discussing Torah topics. It wasn't uh, a discussion about just the weather. But they were so gracious. I spoke in Yiddish, and they were so gracious 
and how they extended the invitation, even though it was last minute, usually an invitation like that, they call you two weeks before, three weeks before, and this was three days before, four days before. So I just want to publicly acknowledge the Yortzeit, Zechuso Yoge Noleinu, and to thank all of the Askonim who extended such warmth and such a beautiful atmosphere uh, to, to me and Bechlal, uh, how the whole program went with such dignity. Now, I want to open and say that Mekubolim said long ago, and many Rebbes used to talk about it, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Satma Rebbe, Zechert Tzadik, Zechronim Levrocha, that when we come into Shabbos, we have, we go from Chol into the power of Shabbos. And it's a jump. It's like going in an elevator at floor one and getting out at the hundredth floor. But what they speak about, and that's why we say Kagavna, which is the Zoyer from Parshas Vayakel, about the Midas, that Kagavna, that just like those come down, HaKodesh Baruch all of the Midas meet from Olam Hazet to Olam Haba to... Um, but what happens if you go from Yom Tif into Shabbos? We don't say Kagavna or Snari Meyof for Kumi. We begin at the hundredth floor. So the, the Tzaddikim spoke of the level of a Shabbos that comes immediately after a Yom Tif or a Shabbos that comes, or a, a Yom Tov that comes right after Shabbos. And we are arriving at the level of where it left off, and it's unbelievable power to be Mashpia. So you should just know that when we went from Rosh Hashanah into Shabbos, and we went from Simcha's Torah into Shabbos, it wasn't just a regular Shabbos. It was a Shabbos with the full dignity and power to propel us, Klal Yisrael, into the highest of high. Now, the Skelena Rebbe once said, Zecher Tzedek Levrocha, the, the great-grandfather of this Skelena Rebbe, because the Skelena Rebbe had a, a son, Marenu Rabbein Horav, Yisrael Avram, who was the Zayda of the now new Skelena Rebbe. And it went from him to his son, who Nebuch was just Rebbe around three, four years and got very sick, lo alenu lo aleichem, and he was nifter. And now, for the last three months, four months, whatever it is, is the new one, his son. So we're by the fourth Skelena Rebbe in line since the old Skelena Rebbe arrived in America and I was a camper in Camp Aguda when they brought the Skelena Rebbe Zecher Tzadik V'Kadosh Levrocha when he came like in 1958 or 59 uh, and took him around to the learning groups and I was in one of those learning groups as a young boy, as a camper. And you saw the Kedusha and the Tahara. And he once said that the word Cheshven, which is the name of the month, we're having Rosh Chodesh this Friday and this Shabbos, that that's the name of the month. And it's spelled Ches Shin Vov Nun. But he said if you, you transferred and transpose the vav to a vase, 
it would still be pronounced Cheshvin, Cheshvin, Cheshvon, and it's a remez to us that after the avoida that we had for 51 days, because you know, it says Hoshan no, save us in the schos of no, nun aleph, the 51 days, which from Rosh Chodesh Elul through Rosh Hashanah is 51 days. And we started off with a bushel basket and with all sorts of peklach that we had to throw into the water by Tashlich. And then we came out at the end of Simchas Torah that we did Tshuva Me'ava, Tshuva Me'simcha, and Nas, as the Gemara says, Nasa Lo Kezochios. They all became mitzvahs. So said the Skolena Rebbe that the word Cheshvin, when we say it, usually means the name of the month. But it's a remiss to the Cheshvin because when we come out, we have so many schusim in that water because we did tshuva me'ava. And that's why we can refer to the month as cheshbin, that you can make a cheshbin of all the schusim and the mitzvahs that are there, and as I told you, reborach mi mezhebush said that we go out to take the water, Mayim Shalonu, and bake our matzahs with the original Averis that we threw in on Rosh Hashanah, and now we're coming out of Sukkot, that they are all mitzvahs. We're running to take the pails and the jugs of water to bake that as Mayim Shalonu in our matzahs. Now, many, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky once asked that when the Pasuk says that Noyach was Ish Tzadik Tomim Hoya Bedorosov, that Ish Tzadik why, if it says he was a tzaddik, does it have to say the word ish? Which usually means a regular person. Whether you mean a higher madrager than Adam, uh, and it means it's a special type, but it's still not the darga of tzaddik. So why does the Torah put in the word ish before the word tzaddik? And he answered and said, it's a message to people that are learning, and even Balabatim who may not be learning all day, but they're earning a Parnassa. And then at night they go for an hour or two to learn either before they go to, to work or after they go to work, that they always have to remember that you can be the biggest tzaddik and the biggest lamdan. But if you're lacking in courtesy and midos, you're not a mensch. You're not, you're, not, you're not at the level of, the word ish is put before tzaddik. You have to work on your midos, whether you're a simple person or even the biggest Talmud Chacham. Because there were many Talmud Chachamim who each and every one of us know in our own circles that because of the level of their learning and the bekeos and everything else, sometimes there was a drop missing in the totality of their personalities to shine forth with the luster that's due and becoming for a Talmud Chacham. So even a Talmud Chacham can't think, well, look, I finished Shas four times. So I can just, you know, who cares how I answer someone or, or whatever. I'm working with the Rabbana Shalom and I'm learning outstandingly and positively. But it doesn't mean you have a license to behave however you want. 
and lack the courtesy. Now, and that's how they answered why it was ish, ish tzaddik. Now, there's a lot to talk about in this sedra, as there is in every sedra, Baruch Hashem. It says that although he was a tzaddik, but he was lacking in one dimension badly. He was standing there building a teva for 120 years. This wasn't some six-month construction project. And every time as Rashi brings, people passed him and said, what are you doing? He told them. He said, listen, the world's not behaving, and there's going to be a flood because it's Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is not happy with how they are living and what they're doing. But he never was mispalil for the door. That all the mekubolim talk about. And many say that, Mo, that Noyach's neshama went into Moshe Rabbeinu, and that's why his life, Moshe Rabbeinu's life, was saved in a teva also, in a little boat, just like Noyach's life was saved. And even the person who pulled him out of the water, Basia, Basparo, if you take her name Basia and you transpose the letters, it spells teva. The same letters in the word teva are in the word Basia. And Moshe Rabbeinu came out and he knew that he had to work his whole life to save Claudius, as we see in every sedra, like in Bamidbar, uh, there was a plague. They were complaining. They wanted to go back to Mitzrayim. They were, uh, that they didn't like. There was no meat. And they complained about the mund. And they complained. There was complaining, complaining, and complaining. But the worst thing they did was they made the, the eagle, the golden calf, because had they not made the Egel Azov, the Geula Shalema would have happened, and the Tikkun of Adam HaRishon's Chet that he ate from the Eitz Hadas would have com com completely solved and forgiven. Now, and that's why we find after the Chet of the Egel, Hashem said, to Moshe Rabbeinu, you know what? Enough with these people. Let me destroy all of them, and from you I'll make a new nation. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, what? If chas v'shalom, you do such a thing, mecheni no misifrecha asher kosofta, then erase my name from your book, from your Torah, if you wipe them out. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu answered him, and said, the ones who are guilty, I will be wiping out. And of course, there was a plague. Vayiplu min ha'om. Vayom ahu kishloishes alfei ish. And the word mecheni is me noyach, the same letters. And if you look in the Haftorah, that's coming Shabbos. Um, well, it's Rosh Chodesh, so it'll be a different. But the, the Haftorah refers, Rani V'Simcha at the end, which is the only Haftorah that we say twice a year, but it's Rosh Chodesh that we have a different one um, for the Haftorah, um, that at the end of the Haftar, when it refers to the Mabel, it never calls it Mabel, it calls it Mei Noyach. Because the ticket for not davening for the door for Noyach came when he put his life on the line, Mecheni Nami Sifracha, and he had the ticket for not having daven, and he put himself on the line, take me out. In other words, he was much in Nefesh his whole life for the Torah and to give the Torah and to teach the Torah. But with this thought, 
that he was able to be misaken that pegam of before, that he was never mispalled for the generation. Now, we know that in the beginning of the Sedra, Noyach is called Ish Tzadik, Tomim Hoyabida. But after the Mabal, when he came out, it says that, that Noyach, um, he made himself Chulun. And the Medrash says, in the beginning of the Sedra, he's called Ish Tzadik. But at the end, he came out, he planted a vineyard to have good wine. He's called Ish Ho'adama. No more Ish Ho'elo Ish Tzadik, but Ish Ho'adama. And the Medrash says, and look at the contrast to Moshe Rabbeinu. In the beginning, he was referred to as Ish Mitzri Hitzi Lonumiyad Aroyim. When the seven daughters of Yisro came home and he asked them, what did you come home so early? And they answered him that there was an Ish Mitzri. There was an Egyptian man that saved us from the other shepherds. So then he was called an Ish Mitzri. But in Parsha Zos HaBracha, he's called Ish Ho'elo Kim. So the Medrash contrast that here's Noyach who began as Ish Tzadik and ended up Ish Ho'adama. And Moshe Rabbeinu was Ish Mitzri and then elevated and elevated himself to the level that he was called Ish Ho'elo Kim. And that is a test for each and every one of us. We do good things. We try and we put forth the effort. We lose sleep. We lose money. We lose our own comfort level, our own resting time to do good things. But we can't let it go to our head. And we can't say to ourselves, listen, I just spent 10 hours running around delivering food to people who had no way of getting food to their house, and I did it. And then I had to skid on the ice coming home and bump into another car. And that is a loss of a lot of the schus. Because you're regretting. You may not say it openly because the Gemara says you regret doing a mitzvah, you lose all the schar. But in our minds, in our attitude, if we don't say that, we at least express disappointments. We have to hold on to the good that we do and grow from there to good and better. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, who went from Ish Mitzri to Ish Ho'elo Kim. Now, we know that the Medrash says that Noyach was supposed to give the Torah. But the door wasn't Roy. So it ended up raining. Ein Mayim Ella Torah. That it rained for 40 days. Instead of the 40 days of Matan Torah, it ended up coming down. Noyach was supposed to give the Torah then. But the Medrash says it, the door was undeserving. So you can't, uh, you can't do that. And that's the reason, since there was so much, I mean, the Medrash says 10 different reasons why the Mabal came. Uh, I mean, Rashi brings constantly the gezel, the, the, the robbing. But the Medrash says they institutionalized uh, ksubas, man to man, the different things that went on. That's why the Mabal came. So it wasn't for only one reason, because the Medrash brings down many reasons. But why was that the method that they died? Why wasn't, I mean, look, HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have just had all of them drop. Or through sickness. But he wanted to send a message to the world who would arise and come about afterwards that there is nothing like the Tahara 
of water. That they were sinking in something that was the segula in and of itself. But they ran after the lust and the, the quest for more pleasure and more pleasure and more pleasure. Tuma. And Tuma, the only way to get rid of Tuma is through water. And there was plenty of water available to them. They could have, have been Tahirim and Kedoshim. But they went after their lust and their desire. So they died by water, showing them that you could have been Toivel in water. We go into a mixture. There's no such thing as even Ayan Hara in water. And that's why the fish did not die in the Mabel. Because the fish are in water and nothing bad happened to anyone in the water. Now, when, when they came in the, in the, the Pasuk says, Bishnas Sheis Meos Lachaye Noyach. Niftechu Mayonos Arubos Hashemayim. Niftechu Mayonos Tahom. Varubos Rose Hashemayim Niftechu. And the Zoyer Akkadr says, when it says the 600th year, it means Noyach lived to 950. The beginning of the Mabel was when he had his birthday and he became 600 years old. So the Zoyer Akkadr says that just like it says in the Pasuk, that Niftechu Mayonos that the wellsprings of the world opened up and the water started gushing out, that likewise the Mayanos HaChochma, the Zoyer HaKadr says, sprung forth with tremendous intelligence, originality and creativity. But it was not that year, it was the 600th year of Elif Hashishi, which means in the Hebrew year, 5,600. And today we're 5,785. So 185 years ago, the Zoyer Kodosh says, on that Pasuk in Noyach, in the 600th year of his life, the 600th year of the, the millennium of 6,000, meaning 5,700, uh, 600, that the Mayonos HaChochma opened up and came forth. Now, if you go back in time to when the locomotive and the fax machine and the airplanes and the cars, all the modern, in other words, for 5,000 years, the world was really basically primitive. But if the, that most inventions and most modern technology happened in the last 500 uh, 187 years in the Hebrew year of 500 and 5600 187 years ago and suddenly things started ha happening Lemech had a son that he named Noyach because in his lifetime, he made people could rest. The Chazal say, and the Medrash brings it, that 
When people wanted to plant, they had to do it with their fingers. No one thought of taking something like a piece of steel or a piece of whatever they had. But they used to plant and dig up the soil with their fingers and put a seed in and do whatever, which was an enormous back-breaking feat for them to do to get food. So, when Noyach was born and started to grow up, he invented a plow, he invented things that they didn't have to stick their fingers into the thing, to dig up the thing, to put in a seed. And that's why his father, called, he saw that this was going to happen, so he called him Noyach, because he made easy, he brought rest to the human beings who were 90% farmers, and that's how they lived, and that they didn't have to go through such they still had to work for it, but it was ain't a doima. It was no comparison one to the other. Now, what we see right after that, that there was a Dora Flogga. And they wanted to fight HaKadosh Baruch Hu, take over the world. So they started to build a tower and it was because they were amazed that they were able to take mud and make bricks out of it. So said the Chazal. And they thought that, oh, we're becoming so sophisticated. We can take on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Well, you saw how they were able to take on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Hashem mixed them up. They didn't understand one to the next what the language was. And they died. So the lesson to us, say the Chazal, as we create something, and we're proud of it, oh, Baruch Hashem, it came out. Even a woman baking a cake. Like if I went into the kitchen, I wouldn't know what to do to bake a cake. How much chocolate, how much flour, how much sugar? I, and if someone doesn't know and you just start dumping, you're not going to end up with a very tasty cake. And when we finish, a person feels that there was achievement, and we're happy that we achieved what we did. But we cannot let it go to our heads and think that we were the gift to mankind, that we did this and we did that. And that's what got them to the door of Floga, why they challenged our Kodesh Baruch Hu. Because they were able to make a brick they thought they could take on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They knew there was a God. But we're going to take him on. He's in the heaven, though, so we have to build a tower. And by building the tower, that is where their downfall began. And that was the message about technology, achievement, and creativity that was left with us forever. Now, we know that when Adam Arishon, um, realized the curse that he got, there's three psukim, one after the other. And I heard this word from Rav Moshe Wolfson, Zecher Tzadik Levrocha, who was just nifter five months, six months ago. And I heard him say it in Torvadas around uh, 60 years ago. And he said that there's three psukim. First Pasuk is talking to Adam Arishon. And he was told, you're cursed, and you don't just have all the food around like you had in Gan Eden that I'm driving you out of. 
Um, and then the next Pasuk says, Vayikra Adam Shem Ishto Chava, Ki Hi Hoyasa Eim Kol Choy. The very next Pasuk says, after Adam got his curse, how he's going to have to live and to sweat for a piece of bread by the sweat of his brow. Adam turned to Chava and said, you know, every person that's going to live in this world is going to come from, is going to be a descendant of yours. You're going to have children and they're going to have children. So I'm calling you Chava, which is Aim Kol Choy, that it's Chaya, you're bringing life to the world. So Meforshim say that the next Pasik, the third Pasik, is that Kodesh Baruch who made for them Kosnos or Vayal Bishem. They suddenly realized that they were not dressed and they were not sneistic and they were not uh, in a state of, of modesty. And Hashem gave them leaves from a tree to put clothes on. So said Rav Wolfson, why these three psukim? First about the curse to Adam, then that he called Chava, gave her the name Chava, because that means Chaya, the life of people. And then the third one about the Aleitena, that the olive leaves, the, the leaves that were brought down for them to be properly modest. And he said, because when Adam got the curse, he could have turned after that right away to Chava and said, do you see what you did? That by talking me in to go eat from that Eitz Hadas, there is death in the world going to be. There's going to be sickness. There's going to be suffering. You did it. But Adam knew that she was red like an apple with embarrassment. He just got cursed and he turned to her to find something, a compliment. And he would have had every right to tell her, look what you did to the world, look what you did to me. He didn't say one word. She was reeking with embarrassment. And in a moment of heightened embarrassment and busha, he found something to compliment her with and not embarrass her further and really lash into her and tell her off. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, oh, I just cursed you. And you turned to your wife to find something good and complimentary to say to her when you could have really yelled at her and told her off, I'm going to cover your embarrassment. You are now without clothes and now you became aware that you're walking around the way you're walking around I'm going to cover your embarrassment because you covered her embarrassment. Now we know that Cain and Hevel, uh, the Arizal says that the Indian of Shatan is that Cain had the flax, he took the vegetables, the cheap vegetables, and gave it as a Corbin. And Hevel took a fat with lots of wool, an animal, and gave that carbon. HaKadosh Baruch Hu accepted his and did not accept Cain's. Cain was very angry about it. And the Pusik, the Pusik says that, I'm telling you a word from Parshas Bereshus, but there is a tie-in to what I just said. That we know that their machloikas was about where the Beis Migdish was going to be. That says many Mekubolim. 
that that's why they were arguing. But when push came to shove, we see how people could come with a cloak of s sanctity and ruchnius and spiritual and turn it into something that somebody will end up being killed. And that's what happened by Noyach, that Noyach was lacking, like I said before, they didn't doubt him for the people because he didn't have full emuna. that it says he went into the, to the ark, to the teva, mipnei mei hamabel. And Rashi points out that what does this mean? That he didn't just go in. He wasn't so 100% convinced there's going to be a flood. And he didn't go in until the actual water pushed him in. And that's how he got into the actual teva. And it was his lack of emuna. And here the Torah called him a tzaddik. I mean, if the Torah called him a tzaddik, he was at the level of a tzaddik. But there was lacking. Rashi brings the chazal. He was lacking in emuna. And the water pushed him in because he was a tzaddik, so it was the schus of the water which was the tahara for the world. It became like a mikvah. Everyone died that was Tomei. And on went with the teva and the family and Og Melech Haboshan, who was hanging on to the te teva as hot as it was outside. But he was, I guess, so big and so powerful that he was able to survive it. Now... We, we know that when 150 days was up and the water stopped, it stopped raining, Noyach sent out the raven. He was angry at the raven, as the Medrash says, because it was the only one that had relations. They were all told not to have any relationships, husband and wife, and the raven defied him. And the raven did have so he sent him out to find some sort of plant to see if the water now had stopped, if it was receding, and that you could see actually a plant or a tree and pluck something in. But it says that the raven only went around the table because he suspected that the Medrash says that the reason that Noyach sent him out is because he was angry at him and that the world will never benefit. He didn't hold of the raven. And in addition, that he wanted, Noyach wanted to marry his wife, the Almana, the raven, the Mrs. Raven. Now, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said to Noyach, you feel that the raven's meat, it's a trafe animal, and the world doesn't eat it, even the goyim, because it has such rough meat and that the texture of the actual meat is terrible. So you think the world doesn't need it so I could send it out, and even if it's lost and never comes back, so what? It will not make the slightest difference for the world. But immediately the Medrash points out that when Alicia went to hide and had no food, it was the ravens who went into the butcher. Achav, the king, had so much meat stored store piled in his area where the meat was held and it was the ravens who went there and took out from there 
and brought to Elisha, brought to Elio, sorry, neat that he should survive. And this was to show him that there's no such thing as a person coming down to this world that does not have a purpose. A lot of people that feel they are worthless and they're in pain, so why shouldn't they commit suicide, which is one of the worst averis that a person could ever do such a thing. But the truth is that it's the job of everyone around another person to pick up their spirits and to express their worthiness. Their worthiness in this world, in Olam Hazeh. Because we have no reason why we were sent down here. And we were sent down definitely for a purpose and with a mission. And the mission is to achieve the mission, even though we don't know what our mission is when we grow up. We don't know why we were sent here. We just hope that we will come across our mission and we will be able to accomplish the mission in its full flourish and fruitfulness. And when a person's down, we have an obligation to say a smiling good morning and good evening to people and to be able to express with a cheerfulness that good morning, smiling, and, and the composure of the person translates and is transmitted to the other person that picks up their spirit, that elevates their feeling of worthiness, and to be able to bring out the best in their selves, in themselves and their mission in life. So that was the message with the raven. But on the other half, there was once a Rosh Yeshiva who went to visit a Balchuvi Yeshiva, and he came in, and after he spoke for around a half an hour, he asked the Oilam, these Balei Tshuva, and they were older, they were like 20, 22, 18, if they have any question. So one man put up his hand, and he was a very intelligent person, and he had become a Balchuva, and he had learned Hamisha Chum Torah, and and he asked this Rosh Yeshiva, "There's one thing that's bothering, and it's bothered me all the years. How could the Medrash say?" That that the uh, the orev, the raven suspected that Noach wanted to get rid of him and marry his almana, marry the Mrs. Raven. That's ridiculous. Noach's going to marry the raven. So the Rosh Hashiva said to him that there are many things that we have in the Torah which are straight halachas. And those halachas tell you exactly what you do in situation A, situation B, and how to live your life from morning to night, from birth to 120. And there are all different levels of learning. And one of those is allegory that the Gemara will say a very strange occurrence and some of Forsham say that's exactly what happened, but there's other that say nothing happened like that. It was only all a mushal, a parable, an example to give us a lesson that comes out from it. So this Balchuva said to the Rosh Hashiva, well, what kind of a lesson could there be with a raven, with Noyach, with the wife? And the Rosh Shiva said that there are many people who are haunted by themselves. 
They are afraid of this, afraid of that, and 99% of the things never, ever happen. And the allegory of this raven story, Noach was not interested in coming near his wife had he disappeared. But it was to tell you that when you walk into a chasna and two of your best friends are, you see on the other end of the hall, and you begin walking there. And then when you get there, they stop talking. Then your mind goes into action. Oh, they must have been talking about me. And that's why they stopped talking when they saw me, when I got near. And who imagines what the, they were not talking about him. They were, had nothing to say about him. But the person who's being haunted is always the victim. That's what they think. And this raven right away thought, oh, he's only sending me away to get rid of me so that he could grab my wife. And we have to sensitize our own emotion because it's a Misa of the Yetzirah who wants to pull us down. And when a person's pulled down, he cannot dive him properly, he cannot learn properly, he cannot function with his mitzvahs, with the simcha of what they are and what we do, because the person's down. And if you're human and you're down, it limits your effectiveness in everything and anything you do. So we have to be able to heighten our action level and minimize all of these nightmares that we have. You know, psychologists say that a person has 70 uh, dreams a night and 69 are pure nonsense and the last one may be at least half nonsense. And they never will happen, never do happen. But when you're into the negativity, that's the road that you are led down. Now, and why was Achav so successful? So the Medrash says is because they had no they were oiv de avodazara, but when they went out to war, they won. The Gemara says, but David Melech's army they lost most of the battles. There were many battles that were lost, and why did David Melech lose? Because they were dilatur and there were snitchers, backstabbers, amongst them. Hashem wasn't happy. It's like a father has two sons and they're after each other and they hate each other. You think the father enjoys this? The father, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was not happy and that's why they were losing the wars. So it says, they were losing the wars because there were dilatur and there were snitchers in their midst. There were backstabbers. But Achav had Ava v'achva b'neim, there was wonderful harmony amongst them, and even though they were oiv de'avodazor, they won every war that they went out to because of this. So we have to fine-tune the beautiful gifts of midos tovos and the ability to, to come forth and be able to understand that we have our mission and the only thing that can pull us down is our own frame of mind and the Eight Sahara is ready, willing, and jumping at the opportunity to pull us down. But we have to fight the force of that current and the challenge of the pace of all of the powers that come into act when we need to move on and to go on and to grow on. 
And we hope that this year will produce such beautiful... Somebody told me that Reb Dun Segal last year, Yom Kippur, a year, Yom Kippur alone, he said he feels, has a strong feeling it's going to be a disastrous year for Claudius. And it was. But this Yom Kippur, he said, he feels the exact opposite. It's going to be a magnificent, wonderful year for Klal Yisrael. So let's hope that we will begin immediately to see that beauty and dignity for Klal Yisrael without any sakonas and without any loss of life. And on the other lane, in the positive lane, to have laughter, simcha, parnasa, nachas, and wonderful health.